so I'm Christy. I'm the community manager over at Interdimension TV. And, you know, it's so great to see everyone's faces right now, like from all over the world. Like my point, the point of this combo is, of course, to listen to Brent and hear about his new 30-hour training. But also, like, I want it, I want this to feel like a circle. Like, we're sitting in a circle together, kind of like a casual conversation. And I definitely feel like that right now. So thank you all for um, joining today, turning on your cameras. And, yeah, so let's get started. Um, so, of course, everyone knows Brent right over here. I write, think he's right over here on, my, on your screen. Um, so he's our amazing, you know, teacher on Interdimension TV. And I'm so excited about this. But next Monday, on November 20th, he's releasing a 30-hour yoga asana advancement training. So raise your hand if you're excited about this. Because <laughs> um, I sure am. But um, yeah, it's going to be, you know, 30 hours worth of training. And it includes 10 lectures, 11 posture tutorials, 13 practices really cool practices. Like I saw it live, you guys, this is amazing practices and um, six master classes and, you know, an in-depth manual and access to our private, you know, holistic Yo yoga flow Facebook group. And, you know, we're just like really excited, you know, that this training is just going to be amazing. Like you have to hear about it from Brett. Um, but before I hand it over to him, uh, real quick, if um, English is not your first language, there is a caption feature for you guys to click on if needed. And if you have any questions, like I really want this to kind of be like a casual conversation. So feel free, you know, to raise your little hand whenever. It doesn't necessarily have to be at the end. And I could, you know, you could turn on your videos or, uh, you know, speak up and ask the question. Or you could type your question, you know, in the chat and I could read it to Brian. Um, also, you know, just to be a little, be a little interactive, we are going to start a poll like during um, the chat, which is, you know, basic questions, fun questions. You could participate it if you want or not. Feel free to. And um, I think that's it on my end for right now. So, Brent, I will hand it over to you. Thank yeah, you. Thank you Chris. Yeah, I appreciate yeah, it. Thank, well, thank you. Thank, thank you guys all for being here. Thank you for your interest in this training. Um, essentially, this came to life because Travis asked me, uh, I think it was probably, you know, within the last year, he said, would you like to do a, a training uh, about advanced asanas? Um, and I said, sure, I would love to do that. Um, and I started thinking about what I wanted to offer. And I kind of thought back to when I began practicing. And I had the good fortune of uh, having some really strong teachers here in Los Angeles when I first started practicing who they were incorporating movements into uh, the practice that were sort of outside of the scope of traditional yoga asanas uh, but they were you know they were thoughtful intelligent movements that really helped to build strength uh, and body awareness to figure out how to move into that I was trying to do. I was trying to figure out how to do, you know, one-legged crow pose. I was trying to figure out how to stand on my hands. I was trying to figure out how to lift from crow pose up into a handstand. Uh, I was trying to figure out how to do the splits and touch my feet to the back of my head and wrap my legs behind my head and all of these things that I had seen pictures of and I would see other people doing. And, you know, there was a part of me that felt like, I think I can do that, but I just, I need to learn how. And so a lot of these teachers gave me tools that, 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 I sort of then use building blocks that I would take onto my mat in my own time and explore on my own and expand on what they had offered me. Um, and throughout the years, as I've been teaching, I would sort of sprinkle a lot of these things into the practices I was leading. Uh, but you know how it is with a class that's whether it's an hour or 75 minutes or even 90 minutes long, you can only get so much in. Um, and so this is the first time that I've really put something together that incorporates movement principles, um, sort of ideas of uh, proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation and reciprocal inhibition, which are concepts that can be really helpful in terms of understanding how to access your full potential in your body, how to work safely and effectively, uh, and then combining those principles with practices that you know, it starts you off breaking everything down from the breath and the bandhas to the movement of the spine and the muscles that articulate it 
the movements of the shoulders and the shoulder girdle, as well as the muscles that are those, uh, the hips into the arms and the hands and the feet, the legs and the feet and the wrists and the ankles. So it kind of breaks the body down in segments, talking about all of the major muscle groups that articulate all of your major joints. Uh, and then it incorporates all of that information into first a set of practices that work with posture categories, right? So we have, well, I should say, first there are practices that focus on, on all, all of the There's practices that focus on just the spine. There's practices that focus on the shoulders, the hips, the arms, and the legs. And then there's practices that take all of that information and incorporate it into posture categories. So you have standing postures, you have back bend postures, you have twisting postures, you have one-legged balance postures, you have arm balances, you have inversions, you have prone postures, et cetera. So there's practices that go that focus specifically on each of these categories, and they're designed to help you understand not only how to build strength uh, and flexibility, but also to understand the effect that a lot of these posture categories can have. For example, back bends are considered to be more invigorating and energizing than like a forward fold, which is considered to be more soothing and calming. And so as much as this training is, uh, is geared to help you understand how to work safely and effectively to build your capability physically, it's also meant to help you understand how to be sophisticated in your approach to your practice so that on a given day, you know, if you're feeling like you, you're wound up, you're restless, you're distracted, you need to calm down, you actually understand which category of postures would be most beneficial for you to work with and how to work with those postures effectively in order to bring yourself into a state of balance and, and mental calm, which is really ultimately the most advanced yoga posture, right? I used to have a teacher uh, here in LA, a guy named Chad Hamron, who um, he's sort of a veteran yoga teacher and uh, a, a funny character. And he said one day, he's like, you know, he, he would give us this glare. He would look at us, he'd say, you guys ever seen these people who could stand on their hands and balance on one hand and touch their feet to the back of their head. And then you talk to them and you realize you're kind of screwed up. <laughs> and so I, you know, that always stuck with me. Like I, I'm not trying to be somebody who can do crazy things, but who is, who is screwed up on the inside. I'm trying to be somebody who is, you know, uh, at peace within myself and who can help other people find the same thing. And the, the practice of yoga uh, I feel like is hugely helpful towards that end if you understand how the different postures work and how to work safely and effectively. So that's what this training is about. And then the last piece is that it takes all of the information that we've learned from the individual body parts, the posture categories, and puts that together in a series of six master classes uh, that on different of strength building, flexibility, mobility, as well. So it kind of wraps all of the work that you've done first two up into the third series uh, um, and final part of the training, it's meant to integrate everything together. So that's the idea of the training. There are homework assignments. The, as Christy mentioned, there's a manual. Um, there's a lot of information. You know, it's meant to be something that you can do at your own pace. Uh, it's something that I hope will offer you information and insight that possibly you haven't heard before. Um, maybe it will, hopefully it will inspire you to be able to feel free on your mat, to be able to explore confidently and effectively in a way that's going to help you build the practice that you want to have for yourself. So that's sort of the five cent tour of what this training is all about. Uh, and if you guys have any questions uh, i'm more than happy to answer them um that's what we're here to do so let me know how any of that sounds to you or what questions you may have and i think i saw christy put up the poll i took it off my screen because i couldn't see you guys when the poll came up but um christy is there a way for me to bring that back up because i'd love to know that information yeah i i think i just brought it back up but let me know oh there it is poll, poll. yeah Ah, got it. Okay, got it, got it, got it. So, yeah, if you guys want to answer those questions, I would be curious to know. I'm curious to know how long people have been practicing, how often you practice, what it is that brings you to your mat, uh, whether or not you've done a teacher training before, and then what your interest is in this training. So um, you can either answer those things on the poll if you like, or feel free to just speak freely uh, if you would like.
Let me give you that Chad Hammer and glare as I wait for somebody to say something. <laughs> I'm, I'm really excited um, about this just to break it up because I feel like my practice was quite um, ego driven in the beginning and just an asana practice. Um, and then I did my teacher training and flipped that 360 around and went through this massive transformation journey, which I think I'm still going on. Um, but I love actually now just learning um, how to do the pose. So breaking it up and what's working and especially from a teacher point of view, how can I teach my students in a safe way without the ego as well and just have fun and enjoy it um, and learn and just learn exactly what we're doing. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm really excited just to learn yeah. and absorb as much as possible. Mm. Yeah, and you said a really important thing, Alicia, which is um, having fun. You know, um, this practice can be very challenging, especially when you're working on advanced asanas, and it can, it can be discouraging, it can be frustrating sometimes when we're not able to accomplish what we sort of have in our minds that we want to do. Um, but hopefully this training will uh, give you some ideas about how to have fun with the process of growth. And also, my my hope is that it will help you cultivate a mindset if you don't already have one of openness to possibility so that no matter what happens, whether you accomplish the, the goal that you're striving for or whether you get injured or you know whether your life circumstances change completely and you're not able to practice as much as you would like, that you're still able to find joy in the process of being able to do whatever you can do, right? This. This practice is not meant to be something that burdens us. It's meant to be something that liberates us. And that's, to me, that's so important. It's the most important thing because I, I feel like a lot of times people get attached to feeling like I need to practice a certain amount every day or, uh, you know, I need to get this posture. Otherwise, I'm not, you know, doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And I understand, you know, having, uh, having a schedule and having things that motivate you and keep you on track. And I think that's all well and good. But being able to be flexible in your mind and in your emotions when things don't go as planned, to me, that's re really the, the main value of this practice, being able to say, okay, that didn't go the way I was hoping. Like, for example, just this morning, I went to the gym. I've been trying to do some uh, cardio work because I feel like I don't really get much cardio on my mat. So I've been doing a rowing machine, which I really enjoy. And this morning, about, I don't know, four minutes into the rowing machine, my back started feeling a little bit not quite right. So I had to stop. I was planning on going for another 15 minutes, and I was really looking forward to the feeling that I get after I do a full 20 minutes on the rowing machine. But today, my body said, no, you don't get to do that. And so in my life before yoga, I'm sure I would have gotten frustrated. I would have, you know, sort of beat myself up about the situation and maybe even try to push through it and hurt myself more. But there's something beautiful about being able to go, okay, not today. Today we go on the treadmill and walk for a little bit or something else. You know what I mean? Just being able to roll with what happens and being able to find some kind of opportunity to learn and to grow through whatever the circumstances may be. So to me, you know, that's what, the journey of learning how to advance my physical practice has shown me because uh, I know some of you may be aware of Dharma Mitra, uh, who's a teacher in New York. Um, he's an extremely unusually capable person physically. Uh, you know, he famously created a poster of 908 postures, and he's doing all kinds of crazy things. He's standing on one hand while holding the other foot to the back of his head, and you know, he's he's doing just the craziest things you can imagine. But now he's, I think he's in his early 80s. Famously um, shows that, that poster to a lot of his students and he'll point to different postures and he'll, he'll smile and say, that one's gone and that one's gone and can't do that one anymore. You know, so as hard as we work to accomplish these things, there's going to come a point when some of them are no longer going to be possible for us. And we need to be able to figure out how to be at peace with that, right? And so this process of learning, it's, it's almost like um, 
it's almost counterintuitive, the fact that we work so hard in order to be able to accomplish something, in order to be able to be at peace when we can no longer do it, if that makes sense, right? But you have to work as hard as you can in order to know what you're capable of, in order to get to that place in your mind where you can let it go when you're no longer capable of it. Does that make sense? I had this, sorry, I just quickly say this. I had been doing your um, classes, obviously, with you, with the Ashtanga, but also with in the dimension. And I've been trying to get my crane for years, for like six years, and it was so frustrating, but I was so attached to getting the crane, um, like I was in all the harder poses in the beginning of my practice. And literally just after training with you for the last however long that's been, I don't know, um, six to eight months maybe, or even a year maybe now, um, I just, I think because I let go and we just started feeling into the body, we would have fun. There was no attachment there. I can literally just do my crane without even thinking about it. And it's so light. And it's just this like, what the hell is happening? Like I'm here and I'm holding it and it feels so good. And it's just like, huh, like, and it was literally, it was literally because I totally let go of the attachment and I didn't care whether I got it or not. And it, it didn't really change anything in strength, but it was everything to do with um, everything inside, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, it was, a, it was amazing. <clears throat> yeah, that's beautiful. Um, a stronger practice definitely builds strength, uh, especially the lifting strength. So I'm happy that you're, you're feeling that benefit. And, and yes, um, you know, what you just said, it reminds me of kind of one of the most important lessons of yoga, which is, let work alone be your reward and never the fruits thereof. That's a line from one of the Upanishads. And uh, Mr. Iyengar was fond of repeating that. Um, and that's really what it's about. If you can learn to have joy, find joy in the process, then that's what matters. It's not about the end result. It's about what you're doing right now, one moment to the next. And can you really be present with what you're feeling, what you're experiencing, and staying curious, staying open to possibilities, staying determined to work through whatever resistance you might be feeling whatever setbacks you might be dealing with to me it's all about the mindset and once you get the mindset right you know the physical tends to follow but even if it doesn't you still have the right mindset and and that's what that's the most important thing because you can share that with anybody you know you can share that with somebody in a wheelchair and help them feel better help them find meaning in their in their daily existence and that, you know, as a, as a human being, that's the most valuable thing I think that you can give to somebody is just helping them find peace and joy. Um, I was, I don't know if any of you have seen the, the series on Netflix about David Beckham. I didn't really know anything about him. You know, American, I didn't really follow him much. Um, but he was talking about a, a big game that he was playing in at one point. And he had a, there was a free kick towards the end of the game and he was either going to make the kick and save the day or he was going to miss the kick and and it was going to be you know heartbreak for all of the fans and they asked him in the series uh what was going through your mind in that moment as we were about to take that kick did anybody see the series does anybody know what he said nobody watched the series so what he said was i just wanted to make people happy and i thought that was such a beautiful response you know he he, he knew that, you know, there's, there's suffering, there's struggling in the world. Everybody has hardships, everybody has things they're dealing with. And he just wanted to bring joy to people. And if you can find a way to bring joy to yourself through your practice, then you can share that with other people and it magnifies your own joy. It makes it even better. There's another story about, um, there's a pose, Bharad Vajasana. I think I maybe did a class on this at one point. I can't remember. Um, but Bharad Vajasana is a deep twist with your legs and half lotus. And it's uh, named after a sage named Bharad Vaja. And um, the story of Bharad Vaja in a nutshell is that he was, uh, he was determined to study the Vedas and learn everything that was possible to be learned. And so he spent his whole first life uh, learning all about the Vedas, studying morning, noon, and night. And he got to the end of his life and he died. And he came back in his next lifetime and he hadn't achieved liberation. And so he decided he needed to study even harder. So he studied more and more and he learned more and more. And then he got to the end of his second life 
and he died and he came back in his third life and he realized he still hadn't achieved liberation. So he, he thought he needed to work harder and harder. And he developed this reputation as being this reclusive, you know, hermit who you know knew a lot of things, but nobody knew anything about him. And he never came out into the community or anything like that. And he got to the end of his third life and he was about to die and Shiva appeared to him on his deathbed. And Bharat Bajaga got all excited. He said, my Lord, you've come to take me with you. And Shiva said, no, you fool. What are you doing? You're wasting your life trying to learn all these things. And he held up a pile of sand. He said, this is what you've learned. And he looked out the window to a mountain in the distance. And he said, and that's what there is to learn. You're never going to learn at all. What's important is that you take what you've learned and you share it. And so he goes, ah, oh, okay. So he died and he came back in his fourth life. In his fourth life, he dedicated himself to sharing everything he had learned in his first three lives. And he, you know, people realized he was funny. He was, you know, he had developed, uh, he found, uh, found a community of students and, you know, there was love and good times. And then he got to the end of his fourth life and he was about to die. And Shiva came to him on his deathbed and Shiva said, okay, now you're ready to come with me. And Bharadvaja said, but now I don't want to go. right this is yoga sharing what you've learned you have to learn it right you have to dedicate yourself to learning doing the best you can to discovering what you're capable of figuring out how to apply what you're learning in a useful way in day-to-day -day situations and then you have to share it you know you have to be on the lookout for places where your particular um personality your gifts everything that you are can be of service to other people who haven't quite figured out how to be at peace within themselves and when you can do that that's the true advanced practice you know um travis yeah i love travis he's he's been such a great um friend and and in many ways mentor um, to me we didn't really know each other very well before i started working for interdimension but as we've been filming and getting to know each other you know he told me at some point that he had a he broke his collarbone when he was a kid i think maybe his upper arm i can't remember but he's limited in his in his movement of his shoulder and arm which has prevented him from being able to learn to do some of the you know trickier arm balances and whatnot but you guys all know travis is an amazing teacher you know he's he's got so much to offer and share and he does it so generously and beautifully right it's all well and good if you can learn how to do the stuff that that's, that takes a lot of strength and flexibility. That feels good, but it's what you do with that. It's what you learn from it and what you and how you share what you learn that really makes a big difference. Okay, so um, I hope you guys will do this training. I hope you'll enjoy it and I hope you'll reach out to me with any questions you may have. Um, but more than anything, I hope you'll take that away from it, that whatever you're learning through the process of the practice, that it, it's about sharing that with other people. Um, that's where that's where yoga really happens. Um, a lot of people, you may have heard people say that Patabi Joyce, who was the founder of Ashtanga Yoga, you might hear them say that he used to say, um, "Practice and all is coming." Right? That's a that's a familiar sort of saying in the yoga world: "Practice and all is coming," and it's nice. But I took a workshop with a woman who trained with Patabi Joyce. She studied with him, uh, I should say. Um, a long time ago, and she said, I was there when he said it, and what he actually said was, practice, and then you teach, and all is coming. And it's a big difference, right? Um, I can't remember who it was. It might have been Desi Kachar, or something, one of the books I read at one point, but they said, um, yoga essentially can only happen between people. It's not something that happens in isolation. And mm -hmm. that's that's a different way of thinking about yoga than we're used to thinking about because most people think of yoga as, oh, I'm on my mat, I'm doing my practice, and then I'm going to go do my life. I have my yoga and my life. <laughs> and the, the reality is you're on your mat in order to prepare yourself to do your yoga in your life, if that makes sense. So I really encourage you guys, and I tried in this training to emphasize that, um, you know, it is an asana advancement training, so the focus is on the, the anatomy, the you know, strength building, the movement principles, but I try to weave throughout all of that as much as possible, 
uh, little reminders that it's about what you do with what you're learning and how you share that that actually brings you to a state of yoga within yourself, right? There, doing a handstand is not yoga, right? Doing a downward dog is not yoga, right? Those things are components that can help somebody become more aware of what yoga is and, and um, put that into practice in their life. I think you guys understand what I'm saying. Does anybody have any questions about that? I think, can I say something? I think what's, what keeps so many people, myself included, and I'm sure everyone here, what keeps us coming back to our mat daily time and time and time again, is that there's so many elements of yoga. And this training is one small, um, I mean, it's going to be huge. It's going to be a big challenge for for, for me, but you know, so many styles and elements of yoga, you know, yoga, you can sit down and just, you know, do 15 minutes of breath work and feel utterly amazing and prepared for your life, you know, for, for the rest of the day, or you can do a nice, you know, calming yin practice or just a gentle yoga or, you know, just focus on a hip practice or, you know, so much to learn. And I think that's what, um, I'm excited about with this particular training from you, Brent, is it's kind of touching on an element that is going to be really new to me um, and really sort of opening up my mind to, yeah, the possibilities of, you know, what my body is capable of, but also what I can then take to classes. And even if it's just teaching the journey towards something mm -hmm. um, and probably never getting to teach any of these peak poses or these really challenging poses in my classes, but even just to take the elements and say, look, this is actually what's possible. Um, and that's what I'm really excited about and what keeps me coming back to yoga. Um, yeah. Yeah, I just thought I'd say that because um, it's just so diverse, the practice. Thank you for sharing that. And it's true. It's endless. It's endless what there is to explore. Um, and, you know, I, I think it was about two or three years into when I started practicing, I ended up having a shoulder injury. Um, if any of you have done the wild yoga series with me, I mentioned mm. it, I think at one point. I've had this chronic injury. It's a very rare and strange thing. So um, your serratus anterior muscle, which anchors your shoulder blade onto your back, right, is inter innervated by a nerve called the long thoracic nerve. And uh, I probably 15, 16 years ago, before I ever started practicing yoga, I broke this collarbone and I never had it set properly because I was, you know, a meathead and just figured I could heal myself. Um, and I, you know, somehow there's scar tissue that's ended up causing that nerve to stop working as, you know, fully. It basically only gets like 10% of the signal that it's supposed to get. So my left serratus anterior is basically completely gone. It doesn't really work at all. Uh, and so I didn't understand that when I first started practicing yoga. I didn't even know what a serratus was. Um, but I was doing all these practices and I was doing a lot of things that were strength intensive on the arms and the shoulders. And after about two years, uh, my left shoulder just said no more. It, it was hurting. It was an excruciating pain. And so I had to stop doing plank pose, stop doing downward dog, stop doing side plank, stop doing crow, stop doing anything that involved this right shoulder or sorry, left shoulder. For about a year, that's how long it took to heal um, the injury that it was the, the damage being done to, to the tendons. I mean, it's a long story, but basically, because the serratus wasn't working, the rotator cuff was overcompensating. And so everything I was doing in terms of standing on my hands and chaturangas, the rotator cuff was working way harder than it was supposed to. So the tendons of the rotator cuff muscles started fraying, and tendons take a long time to heal. So I had to stop using that shoulder for a year. Now, if I wasn't teaching yoga, I probably, like a lot of people who get a, a, a pretty severe injury, would have stopped doing yoga altogether. But I was teaching and I loved yoga and I believed in yoga. And so it forced me to get creative with how I practiced. And it was actually that year that I think really made me a much better teacher because 
it, I couldn't rely on doing what was familiar. I had to get creative about how to work in different ways. And, you know, I, I come from an athletic background. I played football in college, American football. Uh, I played basketball in high school. And I loved, I loved moving my body. I used to surf. I used to skateboard. Now I broke my collarbone in the first place. Um, so if I had to, in my next life, by the way, when I come back, I, the only thing I'm going to change is I'm not going to skateboard. Everything else I'll do pretty much the same. <laughs> but skateboarding really sent back. Um, but I learned things from it. And so what I'm saying is it was, it was that injury that created an opportunity for me to learn how to do things differently than, you know, than anyone else was doing and than anyone else could have shown me. I had to do it on my own. Uh, I'm a big fan of, of literature and reading. And Hemingway once said that you have to go where no one can help you. And I always, that stuck with me. I think I read that when I was probably 15 years old. And there was just an intensity to that that resonated with me. And it came back to me when I was, when I felt my shoulder hurting, because I realized, you know, there were physical therapists and, and, and whatnot, but Nobody knew, no one could tell me, no one could give me a magic pill. Everyone just said, you just have to rest. You have to not use it. Um, but that didn't help me figure out what I could do uh, in the meantime while I was healing my shoulder. I had to figure that out on my own. And, you know, I became very creative with how I worked on core strengthening, how I worked on backbending, how I worked on other things. And I was able, like Lucien was saying, to bring those things into the classes I was teaching and still, you know, offer practices that were challenging to people, you know, on a pretty high level and satisfying and still uh, convey the essence of what we're trying to accomplish through this practice, which is peace of mind. So, um, you know, as you go through this training, I hope you'll stay on the lookout for the ways that your mind is, is operating, because there will be times when your mind will say, I can't do that when what it really means is I don't want to do that. <clears throat> there will be times when your mind saying, uh, maybe it will be saying, um, I need to be able to do that when in fact you just want to be able to do it, right? And there will be times when your mind is saying, this isn't for me maybe, uh, or I'm confused or I don't understand, when really what it means is I need to look a little deeper. I need to think a little bit harder. I need to move a little more slowly in order to figure this out. Um, I like to play the guitar. And sometimes, you know, in order to learn a song, it requires going at like a painstakingly slow pace in order to understand where the fingers need to go and how to transition them from one place to the next. And sometimes with, with yoga asana, it's the same thing. It's just a question of, can I, can I break it down how slowly do I need to go in order to really understand what I want to happen and where the weak link in the chain is coming? And, and hopefully this training will give you guys uh, a better understanding of, you know, the ranges of motion of your major joints, the muscles that, uh, that, that move those, those bones, right? And then how to work in a way that will sh both strengthen as well as stretch to create flexibility and mobility so that you can start to accomplish whatever movements are not quite yet available to you. It's one of my biggest pet peeves, you know, especially when I'm teaching classes and I offer a certain movement. Um, you know, and one, one of the examples that I always give is, uh, if you guys have ever done a class with me, you've probably done, you know, we're, we're taking your knee down and lifting it back up. I mean, I can't tell you the amount of times I see people coming here and they're sort of they're doing this. Right, and that's not the move. The move is get here and then sink and lift, right? And it's, you get out of it what you put into it. So, you know, you really have to be honest with yourself about where your edge is and, and how you can work to strengthen, to get yourself to find, to move your edge a little bit further because that's how you advance your practice. If you keep doing what's comfortable and keep doing what's familiar, you'll stay where you are. Um, and, you know, if that's where you want to be, that's fine. As long as that you're able to find peace and have things to share with your students if you're teaching um, and be present as a partner and as a parent and everything like that, um, then that's fine. But if you want to expand what's possible for you, you have to get honest with yourself about what you're doing and how you're doing it and figure out how to do it 
just a little bit better. Shauna has written a comment, as you would say. Think of your need to stick a deodorant. Exactly. I'm glad you appreciate that one, Shauna. Thank you. Okay, so I've done a lot of talking. Tell me about you guys. Darren, what's your interest in this training? Uh, I actually just wanted to come in and learn what I could from you anytime I have the chance to hear you talk. I'm here. So, um, appreciate but, that. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I've never, I do teach um, animation and stuff and I, I like teaching, but I never have thought of myself as teaching yoga. So any teacher training I would do would be just to to understand on a deeper level, like the anatomy and the movements and and to advance my own practice. But I do, I mean, you, you're compelling in, in talking about um, teaching as the next stage and as the, the true sort of yoga. So it's... Um, yeah, much to think about. Well, I'm happy that you're taking that in because, you know, there's a, there's a lot of ways to teach yoga. You don't have to do it as a career. Um, you, know, you certainly, you can, there's opportunities. And I remember when I first started teaching yoga or I, I hadn't even started teaching, but I told somebody that I was going to learn to teach yoga. And the person I was talking to, he sort of scoffed and he said, I mean, can't you throw a rock and hit a yoga teacher in Los Angeles? You know, he was basically saying like, there's plenty of yoga teachers as, as it is. And at the time I didn't have a response to that. I just felt like I needed to do it, you know, so I was following my calling, but I've since thought a lot about that. And the reality is for as many people as there are who practice yoga in the world, there are far more who don't. And the reason that many, if not most of the people who don't practice yoga, the reason that they don't practice is because they haven't found a teacher who speaks to them. So, you know, everybody has something unique to offer. Everybody has something of value. And the more you study this practice on every level, like Lucianne was saying, you know, there's so many facets to it. The, the asana and the anatomy and the physiology, that's just one small piece of a huge world. And if you can learn about that and combine it with the philosophy and read the sutras and read the Bhagavad Gita and read the Puranas and really understand what the ancient sages were trying to get at and trying to pass down. I mean, these people, if you think about it, there's very little on earth in, as far as human traditions that are older than yoga. And, you know, I think about that a lot and I think about you know what makes something last. And really it comes down to, when it works, you know, we talk about, if we talk about like a watch or a refrigerator or a car that's been working forever, like we, we admire that because that kind of craftsmanship and that quality is rare. So many things are made to be disposable and yoga was built to last and it has, it stood the test of time. And the reason it lasts is because people like you, people like me, we, we, we get it. We pay attention to what this practice is, what it has to offer. And we understand that we live in this crazy world where people are fighting with each other over land and religion and money and politics and values. And yoga is here saying, you know what? Why don't we all just breathe? Take a breath and recognize that there's more to the picture than see with our eyes. And if we can recognize that and learn how to tap into that, then we have the chance of creating connection and, and being able to see ourselves in each other and see each other in ourselves. And, you know, that's, if somebody goes their whole life without being able to experience that, it's, I don't know, uh, I don't know what else to call it other than a tragedy. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's beautiful, man. Yeah. Thank you. And tell me about you. What what's what's your interest in, in this training? Um, well, everything is interesting because um, I'm a, a rather new teacher. I've been teaching for two years, and um, yeah, thank you. Uh, it's not my main work actually. I'm working uh, uh, beside that, so it's a bit tiring because I'm doing also the. 300 uh, hours teacher training at the same time. Well, I'm doing everything at the same time. So, but uh, what is um, good for me is to understand more of anatomy, for example, because 
I am um, very often providing uh, clues to the to the students so that they try to uh, well not hurt themselves because they're pushing and pushing and pushing all the time. So um, what I'm interested in is how you can go into deeper uh, postures, but without pushing harder. And uh, that's very difficult to, to explain to people when they, they want to push harder. And sometimes I, I want them to challenge themselves because they tend also to, to stay behind. If, you know, that's easy, I'll do it all the time and I do it, but this is hard and I won't try it. So, um, yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. And also it's for myself because I find that um, many, well, many of the things you're explaining are hard for me. And so as it's a challenge for me, I have to, to work on that. And so I think it will help my students if I, if I can convey that to them. So. Yeah, for um, sharing that. Anyway. So let, me ask, let me ask you a question. You, yes. So what I heard you say is one of the things you're interested in is, is helping people understand how to move into deeper postures without I'm sorry, I, I lost your last words. Mm -hmm. it's... Ah, what I heard you say is that you're one of the things you're interested in is, is helping people understand how to work into deeper postures without forcing yes. it and without hurting themselves. Is that yes. right? Okay. Yes. So my question is, how do you do that for yourself? Um, I had to try. Um, for example, um, uh, Alessia was uh, talking about letting go. I did that for the handstand. I've been trying for a year and a half to jump. And I did, and I did almost every day. I was on it. And one day I was just, okay, let's jump. And, oh, and I was up. So, and this was a real uh, game changer for me because I understood that when you let go, when you don't think about, I need to be there, but I would like to go there and I will try my best to work on the path it is all different. So this is how I teach my students. So modifying all the time. If you're a beginner, don't look at the, the mat on, on your side and just do what you can. It will be good if you're not injured and if you're happy when you go. And so, and uh, I see some students that uh, because I, I'm teaching in an Ashtanga uh, studio, so I'm doing both. And I saw it was really uh, horrible when I arrived. I saw people going into Chaturanga with the back like this. And three of my students are now putting their knees on the floor because they understood that it's not worth it to, to push and push. And I'm so happy when I see them doing that because yeah. that's my victory. And I try to do that for me as well. <laughs> uh, one more question. You said you encourage beginners not to look at other people. Why? Because um, I saw them trying to do something that they were not yet ready to do. Mm. Like for example, the, the Chaturanga and um, not to to think that they have to go where people are and that they have steps and they can stop whenever they are i mean i love when uh, lauren says you can stay where you are that's a good place to be and i use that and mm -hmm. i see that some people stop uh in a few steps after starting because they know they cannot do it all uh now Maybe they will. I right. don't know. Yeah, I think that's fair and that's reasonable. Um, you know, I have a, a friend who was practicing um, with 
another teacher I know who I, I really like and think is a good teacher. But this friend told me that uh, the teacher told her uh, not to do something uh, that she wanted to do. And, 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 and in a sense, it sort of discouraged her. And that always stuck with yeah. me because, you know, everybody's different. Some people don't have body mm -hmm. awareness. They try to do something they're not ready to do and they can hurt themselves. But other people, you know, that's how they learn. They, you know, they just sort of, I'm a visual learner. So when I see something, I think, oh, okay, that's oh. going there. That's going there. All right. And then I try. And for me, that was a very effective way of learning. And I'm also very stubborn. So, you know, if somebody told me not to do something, that's, that's going to, that's the first thing that's going to make me want to try it. You know? mm -hmm. So yeah, I see. Um, a lot of times. A lot of times people say, know your limitations. I feel like more effective for me is telling people to explore your limitations um, and, mm -hmm. and do it, you know, do it mindfully, do it slowly. Um, but I think it, you know, it depends on the student. So um, this is something I tell people a lot, which is that I think as some of you may know, yoga was originally taught as a one-on-one -on -one, uh, experience. There were not group classes. It was, there was a teacher and there was a pupil and there was a really, relationship there and the reason for that was because the teacher could know the student so if you were my teacher you would know oh Brent's stubborn if I tell him not to do this he's going to do it right and yeah. so you would know sometimes to use that to your advantage because you would you know you would deliberately tell me not to do something knowing that I would try it and then there would be other times when you would tell me you know a different approach and and there would be an understanding that would be um, conducive to uh, the student's growth, but also to the teacher's development as well, which I think is often overlooked. You know, we as teachers, we learn from our students. We watch them. We see oh, yes. how they practice. We see what their tendencies are, where their shortcomings are. So we don't really necessarily have that way of teaching so much anymore in the modern world. But I really encourage teachers as much as possible, get to know your students, you know, to the degree that they're open to it, um, you know, Ask them who they are, you know, where they're from, what they do, and, and, and try to understand what their struggles are. Because the more you can understand, you know, what goes into each person and their personality and the things that motivate them and the things that scare them, the yeah. more effective you can be as a guide for them on their path. Mm. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Rebecca, tell me about you. What's your interest in this training? Well, I think you're on mute. There you go. Hmm. Rebecca is typing. Maybe she can't speak right now. There you go. <laughs> oh, there you go. Okay. Thank you. Well, um, a few things. Number one, uh, it is because I really love the way you teach and the way the I love the way that you um get us or or facilitate us to get our bodies into positions that sometimes we never thought I love your wild thing series is one of my favorites and mm -hmm. uh, and I think like at least for me it is something that I'm not really exposed to in the studios or in the yoga community here in the place that I live. It is a town that is known for a lot of um, retired people. So the styles of yoga that are in, taught in studios here are very mild. So I haven't been able to get exposed to that, to go to further. I've been teaching for already uh, almost seven years, and I I am one of those type A people that I just want to go more and more and more. And another thing is that the the way you speak to us as students when you're teaching your classes, like I really want to try to incorporate that into my own teaching because sometimes I feel um, the need to push my students a little bit further mm -hmm. but also respecting that they have their own journey on the practice right yeah. so also I I really wanted to listen to you to um 
what your opinion is on that, right? Because when I, I remember I started uh, with yoga uh, and I fell in love with it and I felt so passionate about it that I quit my job and started teaching and uh, and I'm loving every part of it. And I have had the opportunity to get so close to, the, to my students to understand that uh, that they have their own journey. But sometimes as a teacher, it's a little bit frustrating, especially when you have that type A personality that when I see some of the students that are not as eager as I was as a student when I started uh, practicing, it's like, what do I do? Where do I go? How to get them to go forward because I need they can I know they can and I know like I know some of them they have physical um not disabilities but like they are challenged in certain ways and I respect that but I do know that some of them they can go further and they're just pushing back and I guess that I really really need guidance on that as a yoga teacher and uh, and then I know that practice practicing on my own first, and then I will get the understanding on my own, so I can go and put it into words to others. But it's always good to have uh, guidance on that. Yeah, that's I, I definitely understand. Um, you know, and I have I have felt the same thing that you're expressing many times. Um, I, I see students a lot of times and they're, you know, they're putting in what looks like, you know, 50, 60% effort at best. And it's hard to know, are they, are they scared of being uncomfortable? Um, are they, are they distracted? Do they not believe in themselves? You know, there's so many possibilities for what could be going on. Um, like you said, at the end, a lot of it has to do with you doing your own practice and bringing yourself to the place, even though it may be a very different place for you than it is for them, but bringing yourself to the place where you meet that resistance in your mind that says, I don't know if I can go any further. I don't know if I can work any harder. I don't know if I can find any more energy, if I, you know, whatever it is, whenever you hit your wall and how you deal with that. Mm -hmm. And and, and slowing down and really listening to what goes on inside your mind when you get to that place for yourself, there will be inevitably some kind of kernel of, of wisdom or of inspiration or both that you can pass along to your students, uh, you know, when you're guiding them and they get to that place for themselves. But you can't force it. You know what I mean? It's the old saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. Um, mm -hmm. everybody comes to yoga for their own reasons in their own time and in their own way. You know, um, for me, I came to it at a time when I was ready for change. I was excited about it. I was physically capable. And so I really just sort of dove in headfirst and, and worked as hard as I could as, as long as I could until my body said, okay, you need to slow down. Otherwise you're going to you know not have a shoulder left. And so for me, that's just how, that's my mentality. Um, that's not everybody's mentality. And uh, one thing that I try to repeat over and over and over, and I'm sure you guys have heard me say it in the classes that I have on the platform, do the best you can. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, it's easy to say, do the best you can, and then just give the next cue. Uh, I think a lot of things go in one ear and out the other. So, you know, when I say do the best you can, I will often say, and be honest about that, you know, and, and hold them in a position where they have an opportunity to possibly do a little better. If it's, you know, whether it's lifting the rib cage a little higher, whether it's breathing a little deeper, whether it's sinking a little lower in a lunge or whatever it might be, put them in a position where you can see that they have further to go and just invite them gently, mm -hmm. patiently to feel a little more, to, to go to explore that discomfort. What is that? Is it mental? Is it physical? Is it both? Is it fear? Is it doubt? 
Is it lack of desire? Like, what is it that's keeping you from bending your knee just a little further? What is it that's keeping you from, from pulling your knee just a little bit closer to your arm? What is it that's preventing you from trying, you know, from just maintaining your balance for another breath in, in whatever pose it might be? And, you know, use the postures as, as an opportunity to let students see themselves because there's, I mean, so much of yoga in, in the modern world has become about purely fitness and, you know, fitness is great. It's, we're, we function better when we're in good shape, but it's the mental aspect that, that holds the gold in yoga. And these postures, each posture is, has a unique um, way of inviting people in their body and to themselves how they're being in a given moment um, there was a teacher i had he said don't worry about what you're doing focus on who you're being and i that always stuck with me because you know doing more or less the same in yoga class whether we're in down dog or child's pose or trying to stand on our hands we're physically doing the same things but who are we being are we being somebody who's just doing the same thing over and over without thinking about it or are we being somebody who's being a little more intentional and who's, you know, having faith in the process and who's trying to apply what we're feeling and understanding through the other aspects of the practice to help us accomplish something new? You know, it little things like that can go a long way towards lighting a fire in somebody or turning on a light bulb for them. But again, you can't force it. And this, you can't get discouraged, though. You can't let somebody's lack of reset activity to what you're saying stop you from offering it over and over and over and trying to find a new way maybe this way will work and maybe this way or maybe if i say it this way they'll get it and and you just never know because one day they might show up and all of a sudden they're going to try a little bit harder you, you know maybe something happened in their life maybe they had a dream you know something clicked while they were sleeping you just never know so you have to keep coming with the same enthusiasm and you have to keep believing and anytime you start to feel yourself doubting or getting discouraged, that's when it's time to go back to your own practice and figure mm -hmm. out what's going on with you that you need to, you know, fortify your own resolve and keep your own light shining bright so that others can experience that and hopefully be inspired by it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, and by the way, I read the I book. I, yeah, you're very welcome. Uh, I read the book, The Myth of the Asanas. It's, it's life changing. Oh, nice. Thank you. Thank you yeah, for it. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think that's about all the time we have, but yeah. if anybody else has any other last questions or comments, by all means, please feel free to share them. Um, and for those of you who I haven't been able to speak to directly, um, I apologize for that, but thank you for being here. And I hope that we'll have other opportunities to connect and interact. Um, I think some of you know, I teach a, well, Darren knows and Alicia know because they, they're part of it. I teach a, a regular, <laughs> uh, nice fireworks, Darren. Oh, wow, you quick with that. <laughs> from the animation teacher, beautiful. Yeah. How did I do that? I don't even know. How did that happen? <laughs> <laughs> so Hi, Darren. On hey, hey, ladies. Yeah, on, on Tuesdays, I teach an Ashtanga inspired practice from 9.30 a.m. to 11 a.m. Uh, on Zoom. And for people who can't make it, um, I offer the recordings. Um, so it's a donation-based class. It's open to everybody. Um, you're more than welcome to be there. And um, really yeah. good. Thank you, Dan. Yeah. yeah, and it's beautiful. You know, we have a WhatsApp chat where people share their progress and, and questions. And, and it's been beautiful. I started this group almost a year ago. It'll be a year in December. And um, so many people from Interdimension have joined and, and other people from you know, other parts of the world. And it's amazing to see the community that's formed and the way everybody has sort of gotten to know each other and is supportive of their practices. So that's uh, something that I offer. I have a teacher training in Spain next year, uh, next November for two weeks in person. And then there's a virtual component afterwards to help everybody integrate what we do uh, uh, together. And then I have a retreat. I have retreats to Portugal, there's only one room left uh, to Portugal in May of next year, and then Patagonia in March of 2025. Um, so those are all just different opportunities to, um, you know, join me in practice. 
and exploration of this beautiful wild world that we live in. Well, thank you so much for everyone joining today. Um, I also wanted to quickly announce that Brent will also be part of our first Labor Day weekend Interdimension TV Summit. That's um, Labor Day weekend in North Carolina in 2024. So that would be really fun because we're trying to grab, you know, the community together with different Interdimension TV teachers, including Travis, Lauren, and Brent. So um, I put the link um, for community events in our chat section. So feel free to check those out. Um, and I also put a link in there to the yoga asana advancement training as well, just for more information for you guys. Awesome. And um, yeah, Christine. releases on November 20th. Awesome. I'm excited. I hope you guys enjoy it. If you guys have questions, you can always reach out to me, you know, either through Instagram or just my email, which is on my website. Um, I'm always happy to hear from you guys and happy to help you out however I can with your practice, with your teaching, with whatever questions you may have. So please feel free. Don't be shy. Um, and if you'd like to join any of the classes or retreats or trainings, we'd love to see you there. Hey. <laughs> yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Have a rest of the day. Bye bye. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye. I wish you a beautiful rest of the day. I uh, hope our paths will cross soon.